This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. Uh, let me just introduce myself a little bit further. I'm not a traditional scholar of the commons. Uh, I have done my stints in academia, but I came out of the Washington policy and activist world in the 70s and 80s. Uh, in which I was studying what I would now call enclosures of the commons and trying to oppose them. Uh, it was in the late 1990s that I connected with a number of people who were disaffected from mainstream Washington politics. And we started to develop a language of the commons that was focused on policy and politics uh, from an activist perspective. This at a time when Eleanor Ostrom's work was gaining greater currency, when the World Wide Web was starting to get traction along with open source software. And the Commons was uh, explaining a lot more than uh, existing systems of thought did. So for the past 20 years, I've been involved as a scholar, an activist, uh, a, a book author, a blogger, uh, a strategic networker on the Commons. And so that's the perspective that I will bring in talking about the Commons today. Uh, I have some slides that I will uh, go through to sort of give a, a broad, somewhat um, comprehensive view of a lot of things without going into a lot of depth on any single item. But it's, uh, I hope to show the scope of where the Commons reaches in a, in a lot of different topics. So let me get started and share my slides up here. Uh, okay, they'll put them on the screen. There we go. So. Uh, the word free, fair, and alive, the insurgent power of the commons, is the title of a new book that my German colleague Silke Helfrich and I will be publishing next fall, uh, 2019. And the idea is to think about the commons uh, as a system of social relationships that put certain keynotes are freedom, fairness, and aliveness, meaning it's something that is dynamic and uh, involved with human relationships in a real-time basis. Uh, and these are important elements that we need to keep uh, keep mindful of in the commons. And it's insurgent because this very approach challenges, as I will explain, some of the prevailing notions of uh, politics, law, and economics. So let me move on. to uh, for For the viewers of this webinar, this might not be entirely necessary, but I think it's always important to say that the commons should not be confused with the so-called tragedy of the commons. And of course, this metaphor, this fable, got its start in the 1968 with a famous journal article by Garrett Hardin, a biologist, who said, imagine you have a pasture in which anyone can put as many sheep or cattle on it as they wish. This will result in the overgrazing of the, of the uh, pasture and its ruination. It's, it'll become a tragedy. Well, this has been uh, a truism in economics and among conservative politicians and property rights advocates for at least two generations now. But the point is, it really isn't true. It can contains a lot of embedded assumptions. And the uh, common scholar Lewis Hyde really put it wonderfully that it's really the tragedy of unmanaged, laissez-faire common pool resources with easy access for non-communicating, self-interested individuals. The point is, there's some embedded assumptions in this whole idea of the tragedy of the commons. And in fact, it really more accurately describes the situation of markets in which you have rational individuals uh, trying to maximize their utility, the whole catechism of economics. And we know what that has produced. It's really the tragedy of the market in which all these externalities are pushed onto, the com onto uh, shared resources and ruined. So quite famously, it was uh, Professor Eleanor Ostrom who helped debunk the tragedy mythology. Not that overexploitation doesn't occur, it's just that it's not a commons, because a commons, as Professor Ostrom pointed out, is a system, a community, which has rules, which has boundaries, which has punishments for those who violate the rules. It has norms and rituals and protocols and traditions. And therefore, it's really a stable institution for collective action, as her 1990 book, Governing the Commons, 
uh, famously put forward. As many of you un undoubtedly know, Professor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for her life's work and really showing through painstaking empirical work as well as creative theorizing that the commons is an entirely sustainable, stable system of governance and resource management. So this was within the, the House of Economics, really a rather major achievement that was appropriately recognized. And of course, that work has been carried on extensively by the many hundreds of scholars associated with the International Association for the Study of Commons. Now, I think it's important to stress that the commons is not just a resource, as many economists and uh, even lay, and lay people think, because it's really a self-organized social system. And this makes a difference because if you start to see it as a living system and not just as an unowned resource, then there's different ways of understanding how the commons can work, how it functions. Uh, if you think of it as a resource, that puts in the background the social dynamics. But if you regard it as a social system, it makes the social, relational, personal, ethical, cultural, and value dynamics in the foreground. So I want to stress this point because I think it's so primary that a commons is a community and a resource and the social norms and practices that it uses to manage that resource sustainably. Now, another reason I like the language of the commons is because it helps us talk about uh, the major threats to it, often known as enclosures. Uh, this is frequently driven by the demands of global capital, which sees uh, the resources managed by commons as free for the taking or something they can get at discounted prices with the collusion of governments. Uh, and so there is a certain structural political tension between capital and the commons that uh, is really, I think, one of the great political challenges of our time to deal with. Um, we have to understand enclosure as a process of privatization and commodifying shared wealth, uh, and in the process, uh, dispossessing the people who had depended upon it in all sorts of traditional non-market ways, and then ripping the resource that can be sold from its eco ecosystem context or its larger social context. So this is uh, really, a, I think, an unacknowledged systemic challenge of our time to be able to talk about enclosure because within conventional circles, enclosure is regarded as progress or development or innovation, a lot of positive sounding words. And while, of course, the markets deliver many things that are important to us, it's also true that the over commodification and privatization, privatization of things delivers great harm, or what I love the term that uh, John Ruskin used, he called it ilf, meaning the opposite of wealth. And I think that this is really what enclosure is all about. We see this going on right now in Africa and around in Asia, Latin America, where hedge funds, sovereign investment funds are buying up lands that have traditionally been used by indigenous people and traditional communities, often for generations or, or even centuries. And this is creating the dispossession that we saw in the English enclosure movement, where people no longer have the ability to uh, meet their subsistence needs. They have to migrate to the cities where they become poverty stricken paupers, beggars, uh, wage slaves. And it is a setup for famine and inequality and poverty. It's happening right now. It's not something from the 17th or 18th century. 20% of the human genome is currently privately owned as patents. This has profound implications for what people can research without fear of litigation or problems, and therefore implications for what sorts of medical innovation can occur. Um, there's a whole set of other mark enclosures of our time. It's, I don't have time to go into them all, but it doesn't take too much imagination to see that this is going on in terms our, of our forests, uh, our, our de democratic governance systems, public spaces, and many other uh, aspects of our lives are afflicted by market enclosures. Just one other point I want to point out, though, is how enclosure diminishes our inner selves, our inner landscapes. And I've struggled with how to portray this, and one thing I came up with was how 
this, this is a slide depicting how we Western moderns regard the Great Sandy Desert in Australia. And as you can see, it's a very cognitively driven, precise map with different numbers. But this is how the Aborigines of Australia regard the Great Sandy Desert. And as you can see, it's far more laden with deep, rich, artistic, and emotional feelings. And I think that this helps illustrate a bit what happens with enclosure, that a rich culture of belonging and affiliation with resources, identity with resources, uh, some, some of time, sometimes regarded as sacred, is wiped out, is deconstructed de and taken apart. So I want to talk the rest of my talk about the commons as a strategic alternative to some of these problems of enclosure and the ability to build some constructive uh, new approaches for meeting needs outside of the state or market. First, we need to start from the proposition that commoning is generative and value creating. Uh, it's not the tragedy, as Garrett Hardin said, and it, go, get, it helps us get beyond uh, needing business models or bureaucracy as the only way to meet needs. We can use peer provisioning and governance through the commons to do these things. And this is quite literally not imaginable by many people, especially economists and uh, conventional policy people, because there's no language for it. Uh, this has not been taken, uh, has not been developed within conventional mainstream circles. And I think that's really an important imperative for our time. The commons is valuable in this regard because it asserts a different universe of value than conventional economics. If you go through a lot of the uh, social science literature in the commons, the Ostrom's work, and that of more contemporary activists and practitioners, you can see it's about these values named in red, about fairness, about people taking responsibility and then having corresponding entitlements. It's about long-term stewardship of the resource, not just uh, episodic transactions that are impersonal. And it's not about meat market, market wants and profit, but about basic needs first. The commons is also about, uh, importantly, inalienability, meaning some things are not for sale. Uh, and they should be things that are for sale or have a price, perhaps they should be decommodified uh, because the point is to share these things not as a uh, individually based market transaction for money, but to have greater equity, fairness, control, participation, inclusiveness in how resources are uh, managed. And key to that are these other aspects of bottom-up rulemaking, that the commoners themselves make the rules by which uh, the resource that they depend upon is managed. And custom and tradition are very important uh, in helping be efficient, trustworthy ways to communicate those rules to other commoners and to next generations. I think it's important, it's uh, revealing that uh, around the world, there's an estimated two billion, or I've seen the figure two and a half billion people who depend upon subsistence commons for their everyday lives. We're talking about forest and fisheries and farmland, irrigation, water, pastures, wild game, all of which are managed as commons. Now this strikes people as incredible because uh, we know what market economics and development economics focuses on. It's about market transactions. Well, these types of commons are mostly invisible because except for marginal relationships with the marketplace, there's no money being exchanged here. And so it's not deemed interesting, productive, or constructive to mainstream economists. Yet, I would argue that they're uh, a more stable, ecologically benign benign mode of provisioning, and especially in these times of peak oil and climate change, uh, a model that can be built upon. I mean, I don't mean to suggest that commons are a magic pixie dust or they are perfect, but I think they are a sound social basis for developing ways to meet needs without all the overhead costs and externalities that conventional market economics tends to impose upon the, the planet. I would add that um, this is not just happening in poor countries of the global south. There's a whole local food sovereignty movement here in the north, which has many different aspects, 
the slow food movement coming out of Italy is perhaps one of the most prominent, but here in the United States, community supported agriculture is a major force. And I know in Europe, many European countries it is as well. There's things like permaculture, agroforestry and agroecology, organic farming. And I, I love the idea of the Fresno Commons, which, which is happening in a number of regions around the US, where there are efforts to consciously remake the value chain of uh, farm to table in different ways that are more uh, socially constructive, often through commons. So for example, in the Fresno Commons, there's a number of community trusts that um, manage farmland or distribution infrastructure and things like that, so that instead of the surplus being siphoned away by investors, it can be mutualized and shared for common benefit while improving the working conditions and pay for those involved in, in agriculture and food production. Just a small example of how the commons can be a constructive force uh, in trying to reimagine things. Um, the city as a commons is a burgeoning topic in many parts of Europe, especially Barcelona, Amsterdam, Seoul, Korea, Bologna, Italy, where a number of different approaches to meeting needs that are not driven by absentee investors or the wealthy people of the city are starting to gain traction. In Bologna, for example, you have these commons public partnerships where neighborhoods or citizen groups are working with bureaucracies as partners instead of the usual public-private partnerships, which are often just giveaways to private businesses. You have the urban land trusts for affordable housing and community gardens. A number of uh, cities are trying to explore ways to control municipal data and developing alternatives to Airbnb and Uber that are uh, with platform, it's called platform cooperatives, which are seen as a way to uh, help the city mutualize a lot of the benefit from uh, those kinds of uh, network platforms instead of having it being privatized. Another whole set of innovations going on uh, in dozens of cities around the world are alternative currencies. And the point here is to recirculate community value through uh, region specific currencies so that people can regain some measure of the value they create instead of it being siphoned away once again to the banks or government. Uh, so another commons-based innovation that I think has a great deal of promise, especially as the, well, the blockchain or the generic equivalence distributed ledger technology gains more traction. Uh, this is uh, on the cusp of, of new possibilities, but things like the Hala chain are showing that uh, there are certain network protocols for sharing, um, sharing value, whether it's currency or other information within a community. When you do that, uh, not just in a web for format, but in a way that everybody can be authenticated in their identities and value contributions uh, taken account of. Uh, that's a longer, more complex topic, but I think it's a very important frontier topic for the commons. I, let me circle back to just so we can ha have an appreciation for how the web is basically a hosting infrastructure for commons. While the behavior of the major companies like Twitter and Facebook and Google get much of the attention because of their, uh, their capital and the dominance of the field, the truth is the, com the web is a very accessible infrastructure for people to create their own commons, which we've seen in lots of areas. Uh, this is seen in part through the use of Creative Commons licenses to make uh, copyrighted content shareable without permission or payment automatically. And this is now spread throughout the world to more than 170 legal jurisdictions, creating an estimated, one estimate through Creative Commons was that 1.1 billion uh, pieces of writing, imagery, videos, music, are now shareable under CC licenses. So this is a vast repository of shareable material which, but for the licenses, would not exist. So that's a huge advance that continues to spread. We have the whole open source software uh, explosion that the web and the internet have facilitated, where you have, of course, Linux, the uh, computer operating system, and you have uh, uh, 
open office and Apache and many other elements of the internet that run on software code that is freely shareable. Now this is a, a really profound shift in how production occurs and in the ability of people to have some measure of control and ability to uh, share and modify the, the infrastructure, the nervous system for contemporary life. So I just wanted to give a sense of the breadth of a lot of commons, the commoning that's going on. And uh, that by no means exhausts uh, what's going on because there are certain unusual types of commons that I find all the time. There's a, a, a group called HowlRound in Boston that is a theater commons. Well, who would have thought that non-commercial regional theater would organize themselves into a commons? Or there's something called the humanitarian open street map team that whenever there's a natural disaster will spring into action and devise uh, open source maps for first responders to, to uh, be able to respond, to know where they can find water, where there's a hospital. Another example of these self-organized commons that are popping up in the most unlikely or unusual places. But let me talk briefly about the important need to invent new types of commons and to build what I call the commons verse. Um, I think there's a number of steps that uh, I will give generic strategies that I think we need to think about for expanding the commons as we go forward. And the first priority is to beat the bounds. Uh, this was a historic pro uh, traditional community party and celebration in a lot of English commons where the community would get together on a certain day and walk the perimeter of their commons. And if they saw a hedge, hedge or a fence that had enclosed the commons, they would knock it over. And the whole point was to patrol what was theirs and to reclaim it if necessary, and then to have fun and reassert their community identity in the process. Well, that's a kind of a metaphor, I think, for what we need to do today, which is to identify our common wealth again, see how it's being enclosed, and knock those enclosures down to protect the commons. This, of course, is a larger, more complex topic, but I think uh, philosophically and strategically, it's an important um, challenge for us in, in going forward. A second thing we need to do, I think, is to focus on what my co-author and I, Silke Helfrich, called the triad of commoning. And we have thought through the commons in a way that focuses less on the resources as such, important as they are, than on the social life, the peer governance, and the provisioning as three important dimensions of the commons and how it works. And our new book coming out next September will expand upon this considerably to suggest how certain patterns of social practice and cultural attitudes and behaviors uh, occur in each of these realms and help, help us understand how to make a more durable, uh, sustainable commons uh, that can meet people's needs. So that, that's kind of an operational challenge that we face. We also need to think about building innovative types of collaborative institutions. And I named some of them here, like I mentioned platform cooperatives a moment ago in terms of online sharing. But you can have things like commons-based trusts, such as the stakeholder trusts that we see in Alaska, the permanent, uh, the permanent fund there. The, there's a lot of new types of digital commons, such as blockchain networks that I mentioned. Uh, the federated Wiki is a really fascinating new innovation to allow sharing that gets beyond the editor gatekeepers at Wikipedia, for example, and allows everybody to have their own wikis, but they can share uh, information uh, quite readily without the third party intervention of an editor. There's mutual aid commons, there's many others, but the point here I think is that we need to think creatively and innovatively, especially with digital uh, platforms for how we can develop new types of commons. And I think part of this also is practical experimentation and not ideology. I think we need to remember that the commons is not a noun only, it's a verb, it's commoning, which is about relationships and social practice and how those work in very particular settings with very particular resources. The historian Peter Leinbau says, there is no commons without commoning. So I think we need to think about how that works 
uh, in our various circumstances and how we can start to think about it in a different way than simply uh, inert resources, the way economists often talk about it. Now related to all of this is how we start to take commons to a bigger scale. And I think one challenge is to think about developing shared infrastructure and finance, which can help the commons uh, have more stability and uh, grow. Uh, the goals really, I think, to our, to are to empower commoning as a distributed phenomena uh, that can nonetheless get enough resources to reach a scale and, and uh, security. But it's also about decommodifying production and distribution so it's not locked into the growth imperatives of the current neo-capitalist, uh, neoliberal capitalist economy. I mean, this is a, a serious challenge for global change and, and peak oil. How can we get to a more stable economy, a steady state economy, as Herman Daly called it? And part of this is finding ways to have the economics and infrastructure let us share risks and share benefits. Uh, so that it's not simply some corporate provider uh, providing it and we're basically digital serfs on the digital plantation, uh, but something that we own and control and participate and govern ourselves. And all of this is related to reducing our dependence on the market state. Uh, the market and the state both share a commitment to ongoing economic activity and growth as the answer to our challenges. I think that really has limited value over time, especially as the ecological consequences become more and more dire. So these are some of the reasons for developing shared infrastructure and finance to help develop this alternative paradigm of commoning. And one of the more fascinating uh, aspects of this that is developing right now, uh, still in a fledgling form, but with great promise, is what is often called cosmo-local production where you have the global sharing of knowledge and design, but local production of the heavy stuff, the physical stuff. So for example, FarmHack is a collection of designs for all sorts of uh, agricultural equipment that can be produced on local, on uh, open source principles, meaning it's local, it's modular, it's less expensive, it's not proprietary. Uh, we see this with a Wikispeed car, where they're creating, uh, a, they've created a car on the same principles. There's furniture, there's housing, there's uh, electronic circuit boards, Arduino, which operate on these same principles of global sharing of design and local production. Uh, fab labs, of course, are part of this whole uh, culture of sharing broadly like that and then innovating and customizing at the local level. Now, part of I think our challenge also is to unleash our imaginations by learning the language of commoning, meaning getting beyond some of the uh, old frameworks of ontology and epistemology that, uh, not to make uh, economics such a whipping horse here, but I think that their idea of the individual as the privileged unit of analysis and the source of all agency is really misguided. There's a lot of, I like to talk about ourselves as the nested I because the indiv our individuality is nested within all sorts of collective socially and ecological webs. So we need to start to think in terms of these kinds of uh, networks and flows and not just inner resources. We need to start to thinking about property being relationalized and not some a uh, standalone thing that has no relationship to the earth or to other people. And there's a whole vocabulary that we could go into, but I think that part of it is developing these ideas that name the realities of commoning and uh, start to share them as a, a different way to understand the world. And that to understand that commoning is a process of world making in which our subjective inner selves are implicated as much as our external bodily needs. Uh, and finally, I think people say, well, how do you scale? I think it's not a matter of having a single organization, uh, international or otherwise, that directs things. I think it's about uh, different people everywhere emulating and then coming together to federate, to create what I call a commons verse, uh, 
as a parallel social economy that meets needs and manages things outside of the strict control of markets or the state. So I think this is really the approach, how we reach a larger uh, footprint of impact. Uh, it reminds me of a, of a saying that um, this, art, this Dutch artist put up where he said, the next big thing will be a lot of small things. I think that's really uh, the template for how the future is gonna emerge. The question is, what will be the connective tissue between those small things? How will the players in so-called small things relate to others? I think the issue is really um, that these, what we are feeling internally will have uh, correspondence and connection with large things without them being centrally managed and directed command and control style the way the nation state has been habituated to do. We, we live in an internet era where we can have these many pieces loosely connected. And I think that is really the answer to how scale will happen. I might add, I think it can happen quite quickly as we've seen so many internet things develop quickly and change, arguably far more quickly than centralized bureaucratic systems will do. Uh, so I, th I see a lot of hope in that. And so that concludes my sort of general uh, quick uh, overview of, of where I think certain important things are going on in the commons. This is, as you have certainly gathered, not part of some of the traditional social science because I think social practice of commoning uh, has exceeded a lot of theoretical models. Uh, and part of our challenge is to understand with greater depth and theoretical consistency, how commoning is working, where it's going, how it's evolving. And I think that's an important challenge as we go forward. This last slide contains some of my books. Uh, Think Like a Commoner is probably the best introduction uh, that I've encountered, I immodestly will say. I would urge, uh, if you're interested in patterns of commoning or the wealth of the commons, both of which are anthologies, both are available for free online at either patternsofcommoning.org or wealthofthecommons.org. And they have a, a wealth of diverse essays on different dimensions of the commons. So with that, uh, I will resume my, uh, my screen with me, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that may have come in uh, recently. So Charlie. So, so David, wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, I'm so glad we've got that recorded. Um, and I'm looking at the uh, question and answer window. If uh, people want to um, uh, add questions, I'm watching. Um, David, there was one um, uh, in there, and if you, I wanted you to go back to that last slide, uh, if you could share it again, because um, you're, you're sharing kind of a, the arc of, your, of some of the books on the comments you've written over the past at least decade. And I'm w wondering if you could just reflect a little bit on that arc. Um, like, where did it start? How did these books kind of, what was the, uh, it may be too hard a question to answer in a minute or two. Well, I guess I can, I can do it somewhat quickly. I mean, I, in my 20s, was raised on Washington politics and activism with Ralph Nader and other projects. And a lot of that I came to see of the, public takeover of, or the private takeover of public wealth. But we didn't really have a language or vocabulary for talking about that. And it was in the late 90s that I saw how uh, the commons really helped explain a lot of things, not only what I had witnessed as a young man, but um, what was happening on the internet and open source software and a lot of the network-based forms of collaboration. So that was when I fell in with these other people, not only uh, people like Peter Barnes and Jonathan Rowe, uh, uh, who used to work in Washington, but with a lot of Europeans, such as the uh, Michelle Bowens of the Peer to Peer Foundation, and Silke Helfrich, a German activist, and the Heinrich Boll Foundation in Berlin. And I quickly found through a few major conferences that we organized, that there was a huge number of people, especially in Europe and the Global South, who are very interested in the commons as a way to get beyond the impasse of conventional policy and politics. And I mean, we've seen in Europe how socialism and austerity politics 
are not answer, providing answers. We see in the UK how Corbyn is surging as a vehicle for alternative ideas. And I think that that's why the Commons has such appeal to many people, that it's a way to start to have conversations that are otherwise not permissible, where there's no space in the culture for having. And my books sort of reflect my own um, attempts to solve, or not maybe not solve, but address those problems. Uh, I would just cite Green Governance, which I did with an international human rights scholar, Burns Weston, because he saw that human rights could not progress further under the neoliberal capitalist regime. And he saw the commons as a vehicle for, in, in practice and fact, taking human rights to a further uh, fulfillment than conventional international treaty organizations. So, uh, you know, I've had this eclectic um, uh, intellectual and political journey uh, in trying to answer some of these questions myself. And this new book uh, that'll be pr published next fall, Free, Fair, and Alive, is sort of, with, with Selka Helfrich, is my attempt to sort of synthesize and distill a lot of the things I've learned over the past 15 or 20 years. That's great. And again, I'm watching in case anybody, uh, uh, participants, uh, ask questions. I'm reading through the ones that are posted. Um, one is about uh, uh, Charlotte Hess writing a paper where she was trying to organize the kinds of knowledge commons there were. Um, have you tried, you know, you, you've listed in your, um, in your talk a number of different types of commons. Have you tried to do any kind of categorization of them to help kind of get our heads around uh, the wide variety that are out there? Well, I think that that's a useful process at a certain level, simply to have some category heads for robust areas of activity. But at the same time, I have a certain aversion to classifying based on the resource that they are, because I see the commons as a transversal social phenomena that will behave differently in, say, natural resources versus digital commons, but that will show similar dynamics and patterns in terms of bringing diverse interests into alignment, in sharing knowledge generously and coordinating it, in dealing with conflicts at the local level. And, you know, there's many patterns. In other words, I like to see it as a transversal social set of behaviors than something classified by urban, digital, whatever, even though we need those kinds of categories. And Charlotte's work, uh, she did an important paper years ago on so-called new commons and old commons. Um, and I think that was an attempt to sort of take stock of a, a quickly exploding array of different types of commons. I find that commons tend to defy easy categorization, as I mentioned with the, the theater commons and the, the uh, humanitarian open street map team, uh, which, you know, who'd have thought that a commons could occur in those areas? And so in some ways we have to keep ourselves open to the possibility that commons can occur anywhere whenever a community gets together and says, we want to manage that resource for our collective benefit um, using commons principles. Yeah, I'm, I'm I continue to look at the uh, Q&A. Um, I've just got a reaction myself as somebody who thinks about comments. And, you know, the challenge I have is wrapping my head around these different flavors. And I, and I agree, you know, categorization may not be, well, of the resource or whatever may not be the right way to do it. But um, I find myself wondering, you know, okay, you've got these online commons that, that I've studied in my own work. Um, I was, you know, interested in some of the ones you've referenced that I haven't even thought about. Um, uh, but um, but it's challenging. My head gets kind of uh, filled with all these different types, and and how you get your head around it is a challenge for me. You're not a, you're not alone because I grapple with that myself. That, as I said, I think that the practice that is outstripping some of our intellectual frameworks and theories for understanding them. And it's going to take some time for us to, one, become familiar with the diverse array of commons, just say, say in digital spaces alone, and then to make meaningful and, let's just say, the right uh, taxonomic divisions, uh, if only for convenience, 
while trying to be mindful that some of those divisions are artificial and not necessarily uh, the right ones. But you're right, to get a grasp on this, we at least need some containers to put them in. And I think that's part of our challenge right now. So I'm looking at the uh, time and I'm about to get to the hard deadline to get to the next webinar. Um, I do want to say, you know, of course, I'm, uh, I'm, I uh, think about commons and digital commons, uh, but I have to say, David, you, you know, your hopeful conclusion, at least in part, um, really resonated with me um, in that I know um, in my own work on open source software communities and studying a you know, large database of those, um, I, it really, I've learned that it's about intellectual matchmaking and it's, and it, this can happen at a very small group level um, across a very broad scale of the globe um, very easily. And whenever I feel a little bit down about where the world is at, um, I too have hope um, that, um, as you said, this internet platform that allows us to kind of bypass political boundaries and and do intellectual matchmaking is part of what I think uh, is occurring. It gives me great hope about where the world can go. And I agree, it's, we've seen evidence where rapid changes happen um, grounded on that platform. I think that it, because it's not just intellectual and creativity, although that's an enormous aspect of it, it's also about new frameworks of trust building, of uh, sovereignty and authority that are operational. And in some ways, this is a, a really profound challenge to the nation state as a system of control. And I think at some point, we're gonna to have to have a new rapprochement or uh, ways in which state power is, takes a cognizance and gives space to bottom-up self-organized communities such as these. And I, that's, I think, a hope for transformation and, and change that we need to think about. So David, as I'm wrapping up, we have one last comment from Ohm that says, uh, so let's build something with a smile face. And uh, Ohm, I, I just met Ohm in a previous couple webinars. Uh, Ohm, I hope I'm getting this right, um, uh, is working on as a, uh, with crisis mappers. Um, and uh, uh, I guess I just encourage you, David, to in the chat, possibly put in your email address um, in case Ohm wants to contact you or any of the other participants wants to contact you, if you don't mind. No, that's fine. Um, uh, uh, when I see a statement like, so let's build something with a smile face, clearly you've, uh, you've energized uh, the audience. So thank you, David. Um, as I'm wrapping up, I, I just want to say in beha on behalf of the International Association for the Study of the Commons and all the World Commons Week, organizers. I'd like to thank the attendees and, and I'd like to thank you again, David, for preparing and giving this really terrific, um, engaging webinar. Um, in closing, I just want to remind people that we have two upcoming IASC events, um, both which are advertised in the top left corner of the worldcommonsweek.org uh, website. The first is in November, mid-November, is a, a virtual conference being run by Marco Johansson. Uh, um, and it's the first time IS, ISC has tried that. Um, and I think they're still accepting participation for that. And then the second is the actual 17th year of our IASC uh, biannual uh, conference in Lima, Peru. And the deadline for a paper abstracts for that has um, now been extended to November 15th. So uh, go to worldcommonsweek.org on the left-hand top if you're interested to find more information. So on behalf of IASC and the World Commons Week organizers, um, again, thank you, David, for your time and efforts, and thank you, audience, and uh, uh, we'll see you in the next uh, uh, noon hour. <laughs> thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity myself. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank bye -bye. you, audience. Bye-bye.